Good day. Now that you've completed cardiovascular, hemodynamics, and blood gases, let's put this all to test in an evaluation of pulmonary physiology and the pulmonary properties. Get ready for a wild ride, and at the end of this, we'll have a really good understanding of the theory and application of mechanical ventilation in our critically ill population, and later we'll bring it all together in the evaluation of the critically ill patient with COVID-19. Beautiful. So, very important to start with the basics of pulmonary physiology. Now this is just a thumbnail, a, just a quick survey of pulmonary physiology to help us understand the attributes and the problems that we encounter when we actually intubate and mechanically ventilate our patients. So first and foremost, always important to think about the physiology of the lung, this incredible surface area that is clearly designed for gas exchange through gas units the alveoli, and capillaries that pass the alveoli, those are the pulmonary capillaries. Now the lungs have a lot of functions, not the least of which are the delivery of oxygen into the blood and the removal of carbon dioxide from the blood, but there are also major hormonal influences that are propagated by the lung, reminding ourselves that the single most important issue, of course, is that this is a surface area designed for gas exchange. Through the properties of gas and how gas and blood meet. So the properties of gas, the properties of blood, and the attitudinal relationship between the two. There's an incredibly high surface area to the blood volume ratio, any blood passing through the lung at any given time, about 70 mLs passing through the lung at any given time. And because it is an air-filled organ, it is actually, of course, collapsible. So I want to remind you of something that uh, an individual once said to me. He was a CRNA at Grady Hospital, uh, or maybe a PA in anesthesia. His name was Bob Williams. And Bob would always talk about the physiology of the lung and the alveolar capillary interface as a bunch of grapes in a bucket of blood. And that's how I want you to think about it. It's such a great way for us to have some understanding about the physiologic properties of gas exchange, ventilation, which is alveolar recruitment, and perfusion, which is blood flow passed. So we use the terms ventilation perfusion a lot, but we really do have to understand it in a much more sophisticated manner when we're talking about pulmonary management and ventilatory intervention. So, what our purpose is to really look at is the actual attitude of gas exchange. So, thinking about our pulmonary, uh, our pulmonary uh, bronchial tree, we have the trachea, which splits into two pulmonary bronchi, which then further split every time to the 16th power. And at the end of those 16th power, power, power pulmonary tree, you see that they terminate in a bundle of grapes, which are the alveolar sacs, and the separation of the respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar sacs is the alveolar duct. That alveolar duct must open in order for the gas to diffuse across the alveoli. The alveolar sacs, which is how we refer to those group of alveoli, 16 per sac, every single sac, 16 million alveoli in the functional lung, that those alveolar sacs are all dependent on each other. So in a sac of 16, when one alveolus loses its function, that will affect all the alveoli in the sac. So we talk about opening the duct, recruiting the group, and our focus is, of course, on the individual alveolus, which we never see or measure. So the alveoli are an incredible work of art. It's so amazing what the alveoli are able to do. These are very thin walled structures uh, uh, across which gases exchange. Oxygen into the blood, CO2 out of the blood. In these thin walled structures, this epithelial lining of these little gas bubbles. And that epithelial border 
is actually the barrier to the diffusion of the respiratory gases, both oxygen and CO2. And remember that all the alveoli in the sac are actually dependent on each other, and they are joined by pores. So one of the most significant affects that we see when we talk about pulmonary management is that once we open the alveolar duct and begin to recruit the alveoli through the pores, gas actually recruits all the alveoli in that particular sac. Now, we think about the membrane of the endothelium and the epithelium of the alveoli. In the endothelial wall, there are type 1 cells, and we're going to see that in the next visual, not right now, but in the next visual. Type 1 cells actually line the simple squamous epithelium, and these type 1 cells actually significantly participate in the exchange of gas. Type 2 cells, which are different types of cells, actually secrete surfactant. Now, why is surfactant important? So we all heard about surfactant. People say, oh, it decreases surface tension. And myself as a simple nurse in my early years, I was, I don't really understand what that means. All it means is type 2 cells produce surfactant, which opposes the entry of fluid into the alveolus. It breaks that surface tension because the tension of fluid and the tension of gas means that fluid always wants to move to the gas area. Surfactant prevents that. And we know how important surfactant is because in the loss of surfactant, you have alveolar flooding. And loss of surfactant is something that we see in traditional ARDS types of patients because type 2 cells are destroyed or because they proliferate and start to lay down protein. The basal lamina is the basement membrane of the alveoli, and then the uh, communication between alveoli and capillary is the capillary endothelium, which is also simple squamous. So the big thing to remember is simple squamous epithelium actually allows for the exchange of gas. And you have it in the alveolus, and you have it in the capillary. So gas has to cross both of those linings, from blood vessel to alveoli, from alveoli to blood vessel. And it's highly important that that lining is intact because that's what facilitates for gas exchange. What's also really important is nothing gets between alveoli and capillary. And when something gets between alveoli and capillary, like fluid in the space, the space widens and the alveoli and the capillary are farther apart from each other. So when you have pulmonary edema or interstitial edema, that's going to affect profoundly your ability to exchange gas. When your epithelial lining changes, it's broken or you're laying down proteins, such as what happens with ARDS when type 2 cells proliferate and manufacture protein and lay down a fibrous surface, that is going to significantly affect gas exchange. So now we just take a quick look at our alveoli. So you can see this is a respiratory bronchial, and of course it's a cartoon, so it's a division into uh, it's a pulmonary bronchial and into divisions of the respiratory bronchioles, which terminate in sacs of around 16. Now this is a cartoon. It's not meant to be physiologically correct. So if you're counting all the alveoli and then you can say, oh, she counted wrong. But the sacs typically terminate in sacs of 16. And you can see the small pores in the center of the alveoli. These these pores, these ducts, allow for gas to go across the whole alveolar surface. But when you look outside of the cross section of the alveoli, you see that alveoli are completely surrounded by capillaries. And again, in the words of my highly esteemed mentor in pulmonary physiology, Bob Williams, it's like taking half of a football field, that's the alveolar surface, and spreading 70 cc's of blood across that whole football field. That's what optimizes gas exchange. A lot of blood meeting gas with intact 
squamous epithelium that allows for gas exchange. So of course, number one, gas must enter into the trachea, into the bronchioles, and into all the bifurcations of the bronchioles, terminating at the alveolar ducts, recruiting the alveoli, and then in, in addition, you must have good blood flow past the alveoli. So you can breathe beautifully, you can recruit your alveoli beautifully, but if you don't have blood flow, you're still going to have problems. So it's an exchange of gas, ventilation, and blood, perfusion. And that is the underscoring mechanism in this very simple short survey of gas exchange of the lungs. So we are focused really on two primary things. First and foremost, the structure of the lung, the transition from the bronchioles to the respiratory bronchioles to the alveolar duct and the alveoli, and that whole surface is actually enclosed, of course, inside of a pleural sac, which is a relatively non-distendable sac. And then with the gas exchanging surface of the alveoli. And so I am now going to refer to these exchanging surfaces as the alveolar capillary network. And the alveolar capillary network is what facilitates the actual stability of the gas unit very highly propagated by the volume of gas that finds itself there, as well as the production of surfactant, and the resilience of the blood flow through the pulmonary capillaries, sending hemoglobin in a little march, one by one. Hemoglobin marches one by one. Hurrah! Gas exchange! That blood flow past the alveoli in a small march of hemoglobin, which then promotes for the saturation of hemoglobin, which is the primary carrier of oxygen. So we think about our big picture, the macro picture of bronchiole to alveoli inside of a pleural sac to the micro picture, which is alveolar capillary exchange. And in order to make propagation of best gas exchange, you must have best ventilation and adequate perfusion. So let's talk about how we evaluate that simply at the bedside, not really requiring any special tools, just a high level of understanding. So we're talking about at the bedside and evaluating gas exchange, not really looking at pulmonary function tests or other kinds of strategies that give us an idea about what's occurring for the lung, just really evaluating gas exchange. So you'll remind yourself, that gas must get to the trachea, into the pulmonary bronchioles, into all the bifurcations, and terminally in the terminal respiratory bronchioles in the recruitment of the alveoli, which you see here as this blue bulb. And that gas exchange then propagates with the blood that goes past and actually promotes the oxygenation of the blood. So what we're looking at here is just oxygen exchange. But what is so integrally and profoundly important in terms of how we're looking at this is to evaluate the mixed venous blood, that's the V with the line over it, mixed venous blood, which by the way, travels in the pulmonary artery, go figure. Mixed venous blood is all the venous blood that is mixed in the right atria, right ventricle, ejected up into the pulmonary artery, but the blood we get from the pulmonary artery we call mixed venous. That mixed venous blood traditionally and physiologically and normally is very low relative, low in oxygen and high in CO2. So when that blood flows past the alveoli, oxygen is taken up rapidly and CO2 is downloaded from the blood to the alveolus and then out into the atmosphere. So what's vitally important? Alveoli must be open, they must be intact, and you must have blood flow by in the pulmonary capillaries in order to propagate an adequate and even a highly functional gas exchange. And in fact, almost everything we do when we look at critically ill patients requiring mechanical ventilation 
everything we do with our mechanical ventilator and our blood flow dynamics is in order to maintain an adequate ventilation to perfusion relationship. So we think about abnormal gas exchange and uh, lots of terms get used here, okay? So we think first of all about hypoxemia. Hypoxemia may be caused because the patient is hypoventilating. So we're always aware of hypoventilation. And then we talk about the great grandmother, that's called VQ mismatch. So a lot of times you'll hear uh, on rounds, someone will say, well, they have a VQ mismatch. Okay, well, that's not an answer. VQ mismatch is a grandmother. And actually, there are three daughters, and I only have two listed here, which is my bad, so I'm going to tell you to add another one in in your mind, okay? So VQ mismatch has three daughters, three daughters. Number one, intrapulmonary shunt. Number two, diffusion impairment. And number three, dead space. Shunt, diffusion, dead space. All daughters of VQ mismatch. And we're going to take a look at that a little bit later. Now, hypercarbia is most commonly due to hypoventilation or also to a VQ mismatch. But in this case, hypercarbia due to a VQ mismatch means that I have ventilation, but I don't have perfusion. So very, very important. If I have gas, but no blood, I've got gas in my alveoli, the alveoli are open and they're recruited, but I don't have good blood flow by there, I will actually have very significant hypercarbia, I'll also be hypoxemic. So one of the things we always have to think about when we're at the bedside and we're looking at a rising partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide, our first concern is, is the patient hypoventilated? And our second concern is, is the patient hypoperfused? If it's a ventilation problem, the V in the VQ mismatch is the culprit. And if it's a perfusion problem, the Q in the VQ mismatch is the culprit. So VQ mismatch, remember, always has three daughters, shunt, diffusion, dead space. And we'll explore those a little bit more just a little bit later. Okay, so let's think about some basic components of gas exchange, okay? When we're thinking about gas exchange, what we're actually looking at is the mean pressure that drives the gas flow in the airways, that's known as your mean airway pressure, and the actual fraction of atmospheric pressure, that is oxygen. That's what FiO2 is. So if I ever see you and say, tell me what FiO2 is, don't tell me what the initials stand for, fraction of inspired oxygen, but rather that it's a fraction of the atmospheric pressure, which is oxygenated. Because we really don't talk about percent of oxygen, we talk about partial pressure of oxygen. So if I'm breathing 1.00 FiO2, 100%, that means 100% of atmospheric pressure is what I'm breathing, which means, living in Georgia, that that's around 748 millimeters mercury oxygen. So I convert 100% to the partial pressure. One times 748 equals 748. If I'm on 50%, then that's 0.5 of 748, and that's somewhere around 324 millimeters mercury of oxygen. Now that's why we are really concerned with understanding what FiO2 is. FiO2 tells us about the, the partial pressure of oxygen that our patient is breathing. We're always going to start with FiO2 and then we're going to look at how much oxygen is dissolved in your blood, that's your PaO2, partial pressure of arterial oxygen. We're going to look at the correlating relationship between the partial pressure of arterial oxygen divided by the FiO2 in the decimal. So again, if it's 50%, that's 0.5. If it's 100%, that's 1.0. And if it's room air, that's 0.21. We're always going to consider PaO2 as it relates to FiO2. We can also do a calculation which calculates what we suppose 
to be the oxygen in the alveoli. That's your big A, alveolar oxygen. And what is actually seen in the arterial blood? That's the small a and the difference between them. And the difference between them should always be less than the actual number of the percent oxygen the patient's breathing. In other words, the difference between our supposed alveolar gas and our measured arterial gas should always be less than 20 on room air, should always be less than 100 on 100%. If that gap between what we actually calculate as your alveolar oxygen and your measured arterial oxygen is wider than 100, wider than 200, the gas you're giving the patient never got to the alveolus or you don't have blood flow by the alveolus. And that's a major issue. So PaO2, FaO2, AA difference in oxygen, or what's also known as the AA gradient, the P to F ratio, which is the most common way we evaluate gas exchange in today's world, and then another calculation known as oxygenation index, which I'm gonna save for a few minutes. I'm gonna explain it very well because I think it's really important for you, but I'm, I'm not ready to talk about it right now. Then we look at minute ventilation. So I wanna make sure you appreciate something. Mean airway pressure and FiO2 are about your oxygen. So when I use mean airway pressure strategies with the ventilator, I prolong your inspiratory time, I give you PEEP, I put you on CPAP, I put you on BiPAP, you have a constant airway opening pressure that has raised the mean airway pressure and I should see better oxygenation in relationship to that. And I also, of course, change your FiO2 and I believe that if I deliver more oxygen and your alveoli are open and you have blood flow passed, your gas exchange should improve. By the way, everything I do with the ventilator is the test to find out if I can improve your gas exchange. Second to that, of course, is always the removal of CO2. CO2, is, CO2 removal is actually driven by minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is frequency times tidal volume or respiratory rate times tidal volume. So remember that if your tidal volume is low and you're retaining CO2, you're gonna increase your respiratory rate. And so one of the things we always look at in a patient who is tachypneic is do they have an adequate minute ventilation? Are they moving appropriate tidal volume and sometimes as you increase your respiratory rate, your tidal volume will start to go down. So that means you might be able to maintain minute ventilation, but it isn't efficient. Minute ventilation normally is eight to 10 liters per minute, and it is a combination of respiratory rate times tidal volume. Now, three things we're gonna look at when we talk about minute ventilation. The most important one is the remaining carbon dioxide in the arterial blood after blood has gone through the lungs. That's your PaCO2. And remember what that is normally, right? PaCO2 normally is 35 to 45 millimeters per, of mercury. But we also have to look at your PVCO2, which is actually a representation of what your cells have produced in cellular respiration. And PVCO2 is typically five above normal arterial CO2. So if normal arterial CO2 is 35 to 40, normal venous CO2 is 40, I'm sorry, 35 to 45 PaCO2, then the normal PVCO2 is 40 to 50. And end tidal CO2 is a volumetric measure of what you've exhaled into the atmosphere. And end tidal CO2 should be five below arterial CO2. So if normal arterial CO2 is 35 to 45, normal end tidal CO2 is 30 to 40. So that makes it pretty clear. Five above, venous. Five below, end tidal. And the one you know, arterial. The one you know, arterial five above venous, five below end tidal. Now that's gonna be really important because many of our critically ill patients who are intubated and ventilated will have on display on their bedside monitor their end tidal CO2. I just got back from the hospital with a patient who had an end tidal CO2 of 28 and an arterial CO2 of 54. 
which means the patient isn't clearing CO2. The end tidal is low. It should be high because the arterial CO2 is high and the patient, if the problem was ventilation, end tidal would be high and arterial would be high. But when the problem's perfusion, end tidal is low because blood isn't flowing past the alveoli. This is a really complex subject, but one that we have to apply when we're looking at mechanical ventilation strategies and evaluation of how we are treating our patients. So, first and foremost, in terms of principles of oxygenation, the major principle of oxygenation is the pressure, assumed pressure of alveolar oxygen minus the measured partial pressure of oxygen in the artery. So alveolar partial pressure is assumed, it's a calculation, and arterial partial pressure is measured. It's in the arterial blood. And what we want to remember is if my alveoli are receiving the oxygen that I'm trying to deliver, which means they have to be open, have to be open. If my alveoli are receiving the oxygen that I'm trying to deliver and I have good blood flow past the alveoli, then I should see that represented in the arterial blood. Okay? That is a measure of the efficiency of gas exchange, the efficiency of oxygen. And so incredibly and profoundly important when we're talking about gas exchange for our patient. So PaO2 is very dependent on ventilation, but it's also profoundly affected by the matching of not just ventilation, but also perfusion, okay? So I wanna remind you about oxygenation in the ICU. When the V and the Q are not matched, meaning ventilation isn't equally matched, almost in a one-to-one -one relationship with the blood flow, sometimes we see that related to patient positioning. We can see very significant VQ mismatch in patients who are supine. But for most ICUs in the world, patients are supine. Maybe they're elevated at 30 or 35 degrees, uh, but they are still in a supine relationship. And this is one of the reasons that we talk a lot about position therapy, not just prone, but extreme lateral rotation as well, so that we're always redistributing ventilation and perfusion. Also profoundly affected, of course, by any airway pressure. And remember, PEEP, CPAP, BiPAP, prolonged inspiratory time, all will affect airway pressures. So that's one of the things we look at when we're talking about our patients, right? When we're talking about oxygenation, adjustments that we make either outside of the patient uh, who is non-invasively ventilated or inside of the patient who has an endotracheal tube. And all of it is really inside the patient, but I'm talking about non-invasively or invasively. Frequently, our first step is to increase FiO2, which means that we're increasing the percent of atmospheric pressure here in Georgia, 748, the percent of atmospheric pressure that is oxygenating that the patient's breathing. And then we move to distending airway pressure strategies. So what we're trying to do is to open the alveoli. And we do that by applying strategies that raise the mean airway pressure. And we do that through PEEP, pressure control, high frequency oscillation, airway pressure release ventilation. But really all I want you to know is we try to control oxygenation with FiO2 and mean airway pressure strategies. That's basically it. That's pretty straightforward. So you're a patient who's on high flow oxygen and you're not responding. I'm now gonna to move to some methodology of alveolar distension, which will most likely be if it's non-invasive CPAP or BiPAP and, which, and, and, the, and the expiratory pressure of BiPAP, or if you're intubated through PEEP. So very important for us to appreciate those principles. Oxygen first, distending airway, distending alveolar pressure second, okay? So they don't apply to everybody. It's not 100% foolproof. It's just a simple survey strategy of principles of ventilation. So now we just take a look at this very simple cartoon, which is about the oxygen in the alveoli and the oxygen in the blood. So you're seeing, if you look to the left side here and the blood that's coming from the pulmonary artery, remember that's called the mixed venous blood, 
that blood coming in the pulmonary artery has an oxygen content, a partial pressure of oxygen of somewhere around 40 and a carbon dioxide of somewhere around 46. And then blood flows past the alveoli where a gas exchange takes place, where the alveolar oxygen is high and the alveolar carbon dioxide is low. So oxygen moves into the blood and CO2 moves out of the blood into the alveolus and then into the atmosphere. So now the blood that leaves that alveolar capillary exchange in the pulmonary vein has a high content of oxygen and a low content of CO2. It gets delivered to the left atrium, left ventricle. The left ventricle bulluses it out into the systemic arteries where oxygen is delivered to the cell and CO2 is taken up in the blood. And that's where the transition of oxygenated to relatively deoxygenated blood takes place. So now that blood that is actually now going towards the right atrium and ventricle has a PO2 of 40 and a PCO2 of around 46. It's a very simple property of gas exchange. If all is working well, blood passing the alveolus takes up oxygen and downloads CO2. Blood that's passing the cell delivers the oxygen and uploads the CO2. It's a phenomenal process that occurs with every single beat of the heart, every single beat of the heart. Because as blood promotes flow, that flow pushes the ultimate column of blood, which is pushing the hemoglobin past alveolus or cell. Wow, is that amazing or what? It's an incredible opportunity for us to really understand this and to try to develop strategies that promote the best possible gas exchange. Open the alveoli and flow the blood. Open the alveoli and flow the blood. Ventilation to perfusion. So now let's think about this as it relates to our lung and to our lung positions. So what I'm going to talk about is the traditional West model of the lung. Now that comes from John B. West. He has two fabulous books. They're small, pulmonary physiology and pulmonary pathophysiology. And from my point of view, everything we do in critical care and really in all care should be based on understanding physiology and pathophysiology because that's what gives rise to our clinical interventions and our clinical understanding. So we're gonna think about the West model of the lung. West divides the lung into three compartments. Okay, so those red lines now are designating the three compartments. And these compartments change based on position. So what we're looking at here is an upright 90 degree, sitting at 90 degree angle lung. The apex of the lung, which in this visual is the independent lung, has a high degree of gas pressure, meaning gas rises to the top, the gas rises to the top, but a low degree, I'm sorry, of blood flow. So you can see small vessel here, the blue representing the mixed venous and the red representing the actual arterialized blood that travels in the pulmonary vein back to the left atrium. Now those, those little letters next to that with the capital A, then the small a and the small v, saying alveolar gas pressure is higher than arterial pressure, meaning pulmonary arterial, which is higher than pulmonary venous. So that means gas pressure is high, blood pressure is low, and this is not an optimization. That's your zone one. That's the independent lung. So if I'm supine, it's my whole anterior lung. If I'm laying in the left lateral position, it's my right extreme lateral lung. Make sense? Whatever lung is independent, there's going to be more gas and less blood. Okay. So then we move from there to zone three. And in zone three, the gas pressure is low, but the blood flow is high. Now the blood flow is high in zone three. This is the best place for us to look at the ultimate filling of the left heart is in zone three because that's where blood flow is high. So the blood flow is high, but the gas pressure is low. So again, 
arterial pressure, pulmonary arterial, which is mixed venous blood, is higher than the pulmonary venous pressure, and both of those are higher than the alveolar pressure. So this is also not the optimization of gas exchange. The best optimization of gas exchange occurs in what we call zone two. Zone two, the arterial pressure, meaning pushing the blood in to the capillaries, going past the alveoli, the arterial pressure is higher than the alveolar pressure. And both of those are higher than venous. So what does this mean? It means that the flow of blood through the zone two of the lung is the optimal place for gas exchange because the arterial pressure is higher than the alveolar pressure and both are higher than venous pressure. So that's pretty simple. And this is the place where gas and blood meet in the very best way. This is where best ventilation perfusion occurs in zone two. So when you have heart failure, your zone three gets bigger. That means you got a lot of blood, but not much gas. With PEEP, airway pressure release ventilation, high frequency oscillation, and pressure control ventilation, you make zone one bigger. You got a lot of gas, but you may not have much blood. Our goal is always, always, always to optimize zone two. And we're going to evaluate your gas exchange in order to evaluate appropriately whether or not you have a good zone two. Ventilation perfusion gets interrupted by many things. But our strategy is to try to design the best zone two possible. Okay. Now we remind ourselves that, of course, for us to have good gas exchange, you've got to have a good gas concentration in your alveoli. And so we always have to design a methodology that gives us a correlated response between the gas we're giving the patient and the gas we see in the blood. And a many, many things affect that. The pressures required to open the alveoli, the pressures that are promoting collapse of the alveoli, so like fluid pressures, hydrostatic pressure, or a pleural pressure, pressures that are causing alveolar collapse, okay? And also determined by absorption or excretion of gas. Now absorption is what we make really of oxygen and we excrete CO2 and what the level of alveolar ventilation is. So you can see here with PO2 on the vertical and alveolar ventilation on the horizontal, that we can transition between maximal ventilation, normal alveolar PO2, and looking at that normal range, uh, and then talking about hyperoxygenation in the alveoli, but that does not necessarily always translate into oxygenation in the blood. And again, looking at ventilation and thinking about CO2 and just reminding ourselves that in order to mobilize CO2, you have to have three things. So first we talk about minute ventilation, which is frequency or respiratory rate times tidal volume. And then the third one, which is the one that most often gets neglected at the bedside, which is time to exhale, right? So a COPD patient breathes slowly and they have a lot more time for exhalation, which is the time they use to remove CO2. So when we think about our oxygenation, we're gonna remind ourselves that interventions for promoting better arterial oxygenation are designed to promote better alveolar oxygenation, FiO2, mean airway pressures, and PEEP-like strategies. So now let's look at our first equation that tells us about efficiency and that would be the partial pressure of alveolar minus arterial uh, gas. So that's called the AA gradient, big A alveolar, small a arterial. And the normal, normal meaning you're on room air, normal PaO2 is five to 25 millimeters of mercury, and that will increase a little with age. So a younger person might have 0.5, 
a difference of 10 and somebody my age, 60, uh, 68, that it's going to be a little bit increased because I'm going to have some, some reduction in my gas exchange. It's also profoundly affected by blood flow changes within the lungs, which is what we call the normal ventilation perfusion. So wider than normal difference between alveoli and ar arterial, alveoli and arterial. Number one, the reason is that lungs are not transferring oxygen properly from alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries. Something's happened between the two, those squamous cell epitheliums. Maybe we have fluid, maybe we have protein, maybe we have product, or maybe it never actually got to the alveoli. We're pushing gas into the patient, but it isn't reaching the alveoli. The alveoli are collapsed, they're de-recruited, and they're not participating in gas exchange. So most folks today do not actually calculate the AA gradient, but I would tell you that overall the AA gradient is the gold standard of gas exchange. So it takes your barometric pressure times the FiO2 that you are breathing in the decimal. So we can say here, 760 times 0 0.21, which is room air, that converts to 159. 159 millimeters mercury oxygen is what you're breathing with room air. Now, as that descends the tracheobronchial tree, it becomes humidified. And as it becomes humidified, it loses some of its partial pressure. It loses about 10 millimeters of partial pressure. So by the time it gets to the alveoli, it's around 149 millimeters of mercury. Okay, that's really important. Very important, okay? So what you're seeing down here in the calculation is FiO2 times barometric pressure minus water vapor pressure. And we're gonna just say water vapor pressure in general is 10. So barometric pressure for us in, the, in this equation, 760 minus 10, which is 750 times FiO2. And then we're going to make an accommodation for the amount of carbon dioxide, which is in the blood. So we're going to say carbon dioxide divided by the respiratory quotient. Okay, the respiratory quotient is a calculation typically, typically, that you're going to need uh, from a, uh, uh, a metabolic heart that gives you the true respiratory quotient, which is really looking at the movement of gas exchange. Okay, so it's basically it's going to be your patient's PaCO2 divided by, guess what, 0 0.8. That's what we're going to use for the respiratory quotient. So FiO2, what's your patient's breathing, times barometric pressure minus water vapor, so that would be 760 minus 10, that's 750, and your patient's CO2, which let's say is 40, divided by the respiratory quotient 0 0.8. So you've done all those calculations on either side of that subtraction. I calculated my alveolar gas, I calculated the occupation in the alveoli of the CO2, and I now have calculated my alveolar gas content. Alveolar, and then I subtract the measured arterial. And that is your AA gradient. And I wanna remind you that a wide AA gradient of 100 is not unusual to see in a patient who's breathing 100% FiO2. So Barber's general rule of thumb, and remember, it's a survey, it's not exact. This isn't the most in-depth respiratory course you could ever take. But what I want you to remind yourself is that, in general, the difference between alveolar gas and arterial gas should be less than the numeric level of FiO2. So less than 21 on room air, less than 50 on 50% FiO2, less than 100 on 100% FiO2. So again, all you're doing is converting the FiO2 into the partial pressure that should be delivered to the alveolus and subtracting the space occupation of the CO2 in the alveolus, and that's CO2 divided by respiratory quotient. It's very nice that we're using for respiratory quotient the same number we use for VQ, which is 0 0.8. Normal VQ, 0 0.8. Normal RQ, 0 0.8. We're going to use that number in this calculation. Now, if you're working in, a, in an intensive care unit at Grady Hospital and you have Phillips monitors, you can just put your data, 
your blood gas data into your monitor and you'll get a calculation of the AA gradient. It's really important to understand that the AA gradient is the gold standard of gas exchange that tells us everything we need to know about our patient's relationship. Okay, so again, AA difference, AA gradient, less than 20 when breathing room air, less than 100 to 150 when breathing 1.0 FiO2, which is 100%. Okay, so always have some difference because you always have a little bit of VQ mismatch. Remember, it's not one to one, but larger than normal differences mean that your VQ mismatch is bigger. And VQ mismatch, VQ, ventilation and perfusion, Q stands for perfusion, VQ normally is 0.8. If you have more ventilation than perfusion, your number goes up. If you have more perfusion than you have ventilation, your number goes down. And that's what helps us to define what your problems are. That helps us to appreciate and understand what's occurring for the patient. Okay, well, I think overall everybody said, this is too much math. It's too hard, it's too variable. It really depends on the patient's real respiratory quotient, which we aren't measuring. We're using a standard factor and it's just a lot of math. Okay, well, that's okay. So uh, in the 80s, Murray came out with a scale known as the P to F ratio. It was really, actually wasn't Murray, but it was based on the Murray Lung Injury Scale, was looking at the relationship of the PaO2 to the FiO2, also known as the P to F ratio or just P to F. The PaO2 divided by the FiO2 in the decimal. Well, this is pretty straightforward, right? My PaO2 is 78 and I'm breathing 100%, that's 1.0. 78 divided by one is 78. Okay, well normal P to F is 300. So right now my PaO2 is around 110 and I'm breathing 0.21, which means that my PF ratio is pretty close to 500. That's on room air, okay. As I give you more and more and more FiO2, but I see that your P to F is low, part of the reason it's low is because I'm giving you more FiO2, but I'm not seeing it in the blood. So that tells us that we have respiratory failure, okay? So typically what we say is if you're on 40% or greater FiO2 and your P to F ratio is less than 250, that's actually considered res uh, mild respiratory failure. It will not be considered ARDS unless we are adding in mean airway pressure strategy, which is basically PEEP. Okay, now less than 150 on 40% FiO2 with at least five of PEEP. That's considered moderate ARDS. And less than 100 on 0.4 or 40% of FiO2 with five or greater of PEEP is considered severe ARDS. So what's, what's the key factor for us to appreciate here? The gas I gave my patient did not get into the blood. So it either didn't get to the alveolus or I don't have adequate blood flow. I have a VQ mismatch, but I don't have a definition of what it is because I don't really know that. I look at a chest x-ray if you have infiltrates and my assumption being your alveolar collapse, I'm assuming that you have poor ventilation. If I look at right ventricular function and your CVP has gone way up but your blood pressure is way down, I'm gonna say you have poor perfusion. And there are some other things I can do to evaluate that. And usually it's a combination of both. That I have gas that doesn't participate with blood, that's called dead space, or I have more blood than I have gas, that's called shunt. And typically I also have some fluid in the interstitium, that's called diffusion. So I often have dead space. Gas is there, blood is not. Shunt, blood is there, gas is not. And diffusion distance widening, fluid in the interstitium, separating the two squamous cells uh, linings and disturbing the gas exchange. It's pretty straightforward actually if you think about it. And it's really easy to do a P to F. So here's the one thing I wanna make sure you don't ever report again on an intubated patient or a patient who has CPAP or BiPAP. You never 
report a straight PaO2, you always report a P to F ratio. Now P to F ratio becomes more valid after intubation. It's the most meaningful tool that we have to look at gas exchange. But here's the problem. If I'm on 15 of PEEP or 20 of PEEP, P to F is going to overpredict how sick my patient is because I'm using extraordinary measures to open the alveoli by using a high degree of PEEP. And P to F ratio will, um, will overestimate how well my patient is doing. So now we start titrating down on the PEEP or titrating down on the FiO2 and our patient plummets because we're not really paying attention to the fact that we're using extraordinary opening measures, PEEP or pressure control inverse ratio or yada yada, the other mean airway pressure strategies that we use with the ventilator. So we have to understand this gas exchange and then apply it appropriately for our patients. So overall, the key here is P to F should always be greater than 300. If on 0.4, FiO2 should always be greater than 250. If it's less than 250 on 40% or greater FiO2 with PEEP, we need to start talking about and thinking strategic maneuvers to open the alveoli and to flow blood past. And we don't do one without the other. And by the way, if we talk about proning, we have to consider all three. Opening the alveoli, flowing the blood, and changing the patient's position. Because one without the other may not be nearly as beneficial as all three in concert. Okay. So we just take a look at this. This is just a lovely visualization. Open your alveoli in order to promote gas exchange. So again, normally you're going to have a P to F ratio of somewhere around 476. If you have acute lung injury, that drops to less than 300. Remember, this is primarily in patients who are intubated. We don't really use P to F in a non-intubated patient because they're so variable but when we put a tube in and we're blowing gas in, it becomes less variable. Less than 200 on an intubated patient, 40% or greater, FiO2, five or more of PEEP, but the P to F ratio is less than 200 and then less than 100. This is ARDS and it goes from mild to moderate to severe. Okay, so now let's just take a quick look at this respective relationship. So you'll see patient one on room air, his PaO2 is 60, he's breathing 0.21 FiO2, and his P to F ratio is 285. Patient number two on mechanical ventilation has a PO2 of 90, and he's on FiO2 of 0.5, and his P to F ratio is 180. Okay, now even with the variability of breathing without intubation, you can see patient one on room air, not when you look at the 60, but when you look at it in proportional relationship to the FiO2, he's way better off than patient number two, who has a better PaO2, but is using more intervention to generate it. His P to F is 180. So from my point of view, the single most important strategy for nurses and therapists at the bedside is to always look at the P to F ratio when communicating to our physicians so that we can say, you know, when he was on lower FiO2 with a higher PEEP, he had a better P to F ratio. And now with a lower PEEP and a higher FiO2, his P to F ratio is worse. That means he needed us to open his alveoli. Let's go back to that again. It's always important to consider, did the gas I give the patient get to the alveolus? So now I'm going to sing a little song with apologies to Nora Jones. I put the gas down your tube real slow, but I don't know why gas didn't go. Peak pressure's climbing high, oh no, and I don't know why gas doesn't go. So I'm, I'm turning peep real high. Cause you're not gonna die on my shift. Okay, remember that song. Because when you are blowing high FiO2 and it is not being seen in the blood, you have to think about another strategy. But as we add another strategy, we can falsely presume our patient 
has gotten better if we're using simple P to F because P to F doesn't take into account mean airway pressure. Mean airway pressure is affected by PEEP, by CPAP, by the expiratory pressure of BiPAP. Those can be non-invasive and PEEP with intubation. Pressure control inverse ratio, prolonging the eye time. Airway pressure release ventilation, high frequency oscillation. In all of those strategies, so anytime your PEEP is greater than 8, you now need another formula to evaluate gas exchange. This formula is known as the oxygenation index. Oxygenation index takes your mean airway pressure times the FiO2, and sorry it says times 100, uh, which is okay, that, that'll work. Uh, mean airway pressure times FiO2 in the decimal times 100 and divide that by the PaO2. So oxygenation index actually tells us about the index of the oxygen delivered under a higher mean airway pressure strategy gets into your PaO2. Okay, so this is really, really important. You might see a different formula, which would be mean airway pressure times F divided by P times 100, or you can do it this way. Mean airway pressure times F in the decimal times 100 divided by PaO2. Now, that, the lower that number, the better the patient. The higher the number, the worse the patient. So sometimes we can see that a patient has a PO2 of 110, that looks really good, the P to F looks really good, but when we actually incorporate that we're using a mean airway pressure strategy, taking the mean airway pressure from the vent, understanding what that mean airway pressure is, and using that mean airway pressure in these calculations, what our goal would be is less than 6. Anything greater than 10 indicates that you are using extraordinary measures to open the alveoli and promote gas exchange. So I always say I like to look at an OI in anybody who has a mean airway pressure strategy, particularly prolonged eye time, APRV, or in patients who have PEEPs greater than 8. This is also a mean airway pressure strategy. So I take the mean airway pressure from the vent, multiply it times the FiO2, and then times 100 and divide by the PaO2. Okay, that's OI. Less than 6 is good, greater than 10 is bad. That's it. That's all there is. It's a great thing. All right, so now let's move to CO2. Always remind ourselves that at the end of our inspiratory cycle, as we're, we're promoting gas into the alveoli, our airways will fill with CO2. And remember that CO2 is a product of our cellular respiration, the PVCO2. CO2 is always diffusing across cell membranes into circulating blood, and it's abundant. It's in such a massive quantity being transported into the blood. It's transported to the lungs in the bloodstream, and our hemoglobin, while not carrying it as a saturation, our hemoglobin are transporting huge quantities of carbon dioxide, and then they dump it, and it moves into the alveoli and out into the atmosphere. So the elimination of CO2, known as end tidal CO2, requires your alveoli are open and you have good blood flow past your alveoli. So always a normal amount of CO2 remains after exhalation and that's your PaCO2. So I'm going to explain that with a very simple cartoon that I've designed. And that simple cartoon starts with the cellular respiration using oxygen and carbon chain molecules, most particularly glucose, producing CO2, which is diffusing continuously into the blood. That exerts a partial pressure that's known as PVCO2. So what I want you to remember, PVCO2 is CO2 produced. That blood then is transferred through the venous circulation, the right atria, the right ventricle, and up into the pulmonary artery, where that CO2 partial pressure forces the CO2 into the alveoli and that becomes exhaled as end tidal CO2. So PVCO2 is produced and tidal CO2 is removed and then what remains is PaCO2. Produced PVCO2, eliminated end tidal CO2 remaining PaCO2. Boy, oh boy, is this important 
in terms of evaluating lung gas exchange and understanding criteria. So normal end tidal CO2, remember end tidal CO2 is five below normal arterial. Normal end tidal CO2 is 30 to 40. When I'm hypoventilating, what I expect to see if ventilation is the cause is that my end tidal CO2 is up and my arterial CO2 is up. Really important. If ventilation is the cause of CO2 retention in the arterial bed, remaining CO2, end tidal CO2 will be up and arterial CO2 will be up. If I'm hyperventilating, hyperventilation means end tidal CO2 is down and arterial CO2 is down because I can't look at end tidal without correlating it to arterial CO2. If my end tidal is down and my arterial CO2 is down, that's hyperventilation. Now you might say, well, how could that be hyperventilation? Because if you're hyperventilating, aren't you removing more CO2? Well, you are, you're just doing it faster, right? It's not a tidal volume thing, it's a rapid removal rate. So you're removing a little less, but you're doing it much more rapidly. And end tidal is a volumetric measure, not an absolute measure. So really important, when you walk into the room like I did today, my patient has an arterial CO2 of 55 and an end tidal CO2 of 30. That is not what you expect. If arterial CO2 is up and you think it's a ventilation problem, and tidal CO2 should also be up. And that's a really important constant in terms of evaluating our patients hemodynamically and understanding ways in which we can evaluate what the problem is for our patients. So here's the caveat. This is the Barber caveat, right? No matter how much CO2 your cells make in cellular respiration, your lungs should clear it. That means we might be breathing fast we're removing a lot of CO2 because we're breathing fast, and tidal CO2 is down, arterial CO2 is down. Extra CO2 will ultimately be in carbonic acid, which will then convert to hydrogen ion. The more CO2 you have, the more respiratory work you have. More work makes more CO2, because now I have diaphragmatic work, and I'm, uh, uh, um, I'm actually now going to present with diaphragmatic failure or the respiratory failure related to the high rapid quality of breathing. And that nightmare then continues. Okay, so just as a reminder, we're just going to take a quick look at the end tidal CO2 waveform. So we have a couple of different points here. A to B means I'm not breathing in, I'm not breathing out. And then I have a rapid rise from B to C, and that's the beginning of my exhalation. And then I have the plateau, which means I'm limiting, I'm, I'm at the end of my exhalation at point D. And then I have a rapid, sharp downstroke. So from C to D is actually what we call the tidal value or the plateau value. So what we like to see is a capnography waveform that looks similar to this. The faster you breathe, the shorter that waveform becomes. The longer you have to exhale, the longer that waveform becomes, and it takes more and more time to reach the tidal, uh, the tidal value, which is point D. That's the absolute end value of the removal of your CO2. So we're not really looking totally at the end, uh, value under the curve. We're really looking at point D as being the tidal value of CO2 removal. So this is what we'd like to see on your monitor. And we want to remind ourselves that end tidal CO2 is a measurement of the quality of your respiration as it coordinates to arterial CO2. But end tidal CO2 is also a correlate to perfusion when it's correlated to your PVCO2. So very important to remember, because I know you all know this, in ACLS criteria, Adequate CPR is determined by your end tidal CO2. Yes, we like to feel a pulse, but we know that we're doing adequate compressions 
when we're able to remove end tidal CO2 at 15 millimeters of mercury or higher. We know that the compressor is getting tired when it drops from 15 to 12 to 9, and even if they're a strong man who insists that they're okay, they need to get off the chest and let somebody else in there. Because perfusion is also what brings CO2 to the alveolus for exhalation. So it's both a ventilatory measure and a perfusion measure. So again, remember what our end tidal CO2 values are. Five below on either side arterial. And remember PVCO2 normally is five above either side on the arterial. That if you are hypoventilated, your end tidal will be 45 and your arterial will be high. If you are hyperventilated, your end tidal will be low and your arterial will be low. But when your end tidal is low and your arterial is high, that means you didn't clear CO2 and that is not a ventilation problem. It's a perfusion problem. Okay, so we talk about the PA end tidal CO2 gradient. That difference is usually less than six and end tidal CO2 is almost always less than arterial CO2. And the difference depends primarily on underperfused alveoli. So when you have poor cardiac output, the gradient will get wider. It'll be 10, 12, 18. The gradient could actually be a negative number if I'm hyperventilating healthy lungs with a high tidal volume, okay? But what is really also very, very important to remember is that if there isn't residual volume, that's called residual capacity, that's what keeps your alveoli open, that's called functional residual capacity. If I don't have functional residual capacity, it means that my alveoli may be very slow to be recruited and to be mobilized, and I might also see a negative gradient between arterial and end tidal. Okay, so now let's just put this to the test. I have a patient with a PVCO2 of 55. Remember, that's represent what's being made. End tidal CO2 is 36, which is clear, and 38 remains in the arterial bed. So I made 55, I cleared 36, and 38 remain. So what do I think? What do I think about this patient? Okay, he's making a lot of CO2. He's clearing a lot of CO2, and what remains is normal. So my gradient, 38 to 36, is two. That's pretty great. That's pretty fine. I'm pretty happy with that. The gradient is two. I want a gradient of less than, I absolutely want a gradient of less than 10, but in general, the gradient should be less than six, and this is only two. So yahoo, breathing okay. Might be making a little bit excessive, because I expected that to be about five different, and my arterial CO2 is 38, and my venous CO2 is 55, so that's uh, about 16, 17 increased between venous and uh, venous and uh, end tidal and venous and arterial. So excuse me if my math is poor, 55 minus 38. Yeah, 17, thank you. Good, okay, so 17 is the difference, okay. Now, what about this patient? His venous CO2 is 78, his end tidal is 30, that's the clearance, and the remaining is 61. So the gradient, taking arterial minus end tidal, is 31. The gradient is 31. Should be less than six, must always be less than 10. So what are you thinking now? Well, you might be thinking, oh, maybe it's not calibrated, it might not be correct, and of course those are always possibilities. But in reality, what's happening is you're making CO2, you got a lot remaining and you're not clearing it. And generally the reason you're not clearing it is because you don't have blood flow past the alveoli. This is the picture of a patient with a pulmonary embolism who has a very low end tidal with a high arterial and an even higher venous. And the problem here is that you're not flowing your blood appropriately past your alveoli. So it's such a great tool to help us look at adequacy of ventilation to perfusion. Okay. Now look at this patient. He's making it 51. His end tidal is 20 and his PaCO2 is 25. So his gradient is five and he's hyperventilating, right? Hyperventilation is when end tidal is low and arterial is low. He's hyperventilating. So your assumption 
so you know better, is that it's hyperventilating because he's acidotic. And he's hyperventilating as a methodology to compensate for acidosis. And that acidosis is not respiratory, but metabolic, right? Respiratory acidosis doesn't look at the production of respiratory acid at the cell level. Respiratory acidosis looks clearly at the ability of the lung to actually blow off CO2. You're blowing off CO2 like crazy. Now, the entitled CO2 is 20. If the arterial CO2 was 50, you would then say that was a perfusion problem. But because the end tidal CO2 is 20 and the arterial CO2 is 25, you are actually clearing a lot of CO2. And that's a compensatory mechanism in general. Okay, we can't know that until we look at the pH. We have other things we have to look at. But what we're thinking now is you got a nice normal gradient between arterial and end tidal, but a very wide gradient between venous and arterial. And that tells me that you're making a lot of acid at the cellular level. Isn't that amazing? It's a, such a phenomenal methodology for evaluating our patients, for helping us to understand the adequacy and accuracy of ventilation, and the real key here of whether or not I can regulate acid by hyperventilation and by lung responsiveness to the presence of acid. I think this is probably our last one. So my PVCO2 is 78, my end tidal is 60, and my PACO2 is 68. Okay, so 68 minus 60, that's a normal gradient. PA minus end tidal, a normal gradient. Both are elevated. Okay, now your venous CO2 is elevated, but the difference between venous and arterial is 10. So this probably isn't a manufacturing of CO2 problem. This is actually, yes, good for you hypoventilation. So now I have to think about what's my strategy for hypoventilation. Remember, if you've got hypoventilation, three things I'm going to change. Rate, tidal volume, and time for exhalation. Rate, tidal volume, time for exhalation. Okay, cool. That makes it really strategically beautifully. So what's the point of breathing? To deliver oxygen to the alveoli. Hemoglobin binds oxygen. A very small amount of it is dissolved in the blood. And cardiovascular system transports that oxygen to the tissue to make that little energy molecule, aden adenotriphos adenosine triphosphate. That's what we need to do all of our cellular work. Blood flow and the alveoli, which are really important, so our stroke volume through the pulmonary vault and alveolar recruitment, and also to remove CO2 from the pulmonary vasculature from the tissues made in metabolism and respiration, brought to the capillary alveolar gas exchange, and blood flow and exhalation, not just about tidal volume and respiratory rate, but also about time for exhalation. So the next time we see each other and we talk together and we're evaluating some blood gases, which we will be doing during your clinical time, we'll be evaluating a lot of blood gases. Don't tell me what someone's PO2 is. I want to know their P to F. I want to know their OI. I want to know venous CO2, arterial CO2, and end tidal CO2. Because from that, we can make a good strategic, scientific, objective plan for discussion about what's going to happen next for our critically ill patients. Thank you very, very much. And I would like to say I'll see you next time for Making Sense of Volume, Pressure, and Flow. Thank you.